Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to keep this interactive. So what we will do is um, there will be a presentation initially. Uh, I'd like to encourage questions as we go along. Don't wait for me to ask. If there are questions, just go ahead and either raise your hand. We're happy to, to entertain that as we go along. I will give you a little information about myself. I've been in the field for several decades. Clinical research, I started out in academia. I was at Montefiore Medical Center for a number of years and then at Columbia Presbyterian. I started out as a coordinator and then became a site manager. I then transitioned to industry after about 23 years based at an academic sites. I started out as a monitor and then study manager and then a variety of roles, site selection specialist, quality in the quality groups. And about six years ago, I decided to strike out independently, and I'm now an independent consultant doing a fair amount of work for Barnett as an instructor and mainly focusing on training and quality oversight. So that's sort of my history in a nutshell. All those initials after my name simply mean that I'm certified as a coordinator and as a CRA through ACRP. I'm also a fellow. Uh, that's a new program they have at ACRP, a fellowship program. And the TIACR is just a certification for training, which I've gotten through a UK group, the Academy of Clinical Research. What we're going to focus on today is initially I'm going to go through the preparation, what to get ready for an inspection or audit. The next part will be what do you do in response to any of the inspection or audit findings, should you have any. And then the workshop be part of this will be the, or the hands-on part will be when we are all, we will break into groups and what I'm going to ask you all to do, since you are in a variety of different areas, is to make sure that when you break into your three groups that you have not all the same folks in one group. In other words, if you have folks that are coordinators and folks that, you know, different disciplines, have them mixed up so that they are all contributing in each of the three separate groups. All right, well, I can't see you, but that's me. So <laughs> let's just move forward here. And again, just as I explained, we'll do an overview of our preparation. We'll understand consequences or whatever the findings might be. We're also going to go through root cause analysis and corrective and preventive action. So we'll go through how we do root cause analysis. And what I'd like you to do when we break you into groups is to use some of the different modalities we have, methodologies for doing the root cause analysis. How many folks in the room have actually done a formal root cause analysis? Uh, can someone give me an idea of who's, how many people may have done a formal root cause analysis? Like either using Fishbone, you can use Five Ys, that's the thing most people use, or there are many different modalities, as they say. So how many folks have actually done that formal process in your group? You'll have to unmute yourself to let I don't, me know. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think anyone has. Oh, good. This will all be new for you then. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay, great. This is what this is all about, so that's great. And then the, the warning letter exercise is the, the last thing we'll do, as I say, the hands-on. Okay, so our objective today would be, again, describing the anatomy of a regulatory inspection. And by regulatory, that would mean either FDA, and if, you know, you're doing some sort of global trial, it, you could be subject to regulators from other countries. So just that you are aware, you could have Ministry of Japan, Ministry of Health in Japan come, you could have a variety of people, depending on the type of trial you're doing, where it is located. It's not the most common occurrence to have another country's regulatory body come in to, to inspect you, but just be aware that that could possibly happen, depending on the type of trial you're working on. We can also apply the principles here not only to regulatory inspections, I'm going to focus mostly on FDA inspections, but, you know, also keep in mind a lot of the things we're talking about would apply to just audits from a sponsor or your own audits that you conduct. So just be kind of flexible in terms of the thinking. So again, we're going to recognize how to best prepare and manage your expectations. We're going to describe, I say at least three, but it's going to be much more than three regulatory actions the FDA can take following an inspection. But we'll also discuss appropriate strategies for responding to these findings and then implementing realistic and appropriate corrective and preventive actions to successfully resolve inspection findings. We find that when people sometimes respond to findings from inspections, that they don't respond completely. And the FDA will send something back saying this is an inadequate response. So what we want to do, the objective at the end of the session, 
is to give you all the tools that you need that you can actually respond completely, fully, and that provide uh, responses that would be acceptable to the FDA. Okay, so first thing, boom, the FDA notifies you that they are going to present themselves for a, a inspection. What we have is a form FDA form 482. Now we've heard probably about 483s. The 483s are the findings that they have, but the 42 comes before that. The 42 is your notice of inspection. Okay, so we want to make sure that we know what that is. We will have that 482 presented to us. They will most likely call and say, this is the FDA. We want to come and inspect whatever studies. Generally, they do not give you a whole lot of notice. What I've been hearing lately is that they may call on a Friday and tell you they're coming on Monday. Now, generally, I think there's a little bit more notice in that, but probably not much more than like 72 hours. Thank you.